Ninurta's return to Nibiru. What you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is a Sumerian text that could be well over 6,000 years old. It actually could be a text that was copied from another text that could be in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years old. It's called Ninurta's return to Nibiru. And this is translated by various scholars at Oxford. I'd like to give them credit right now. You can see the project members right here on the screen. I'll leave a link in the video description box. So multiple scholars. And not only does this have a lot of discussion and details on Nibiru itself, but it also has weapons of mass destruction and galactic soap opera I've noticed that with these Sumerian texts, the gods of the Anunnaki are quite theatrical, to say the least. And before I start, because I'm going to read this in full, there's a couple of passages that I want to read at the beginning. And this is 168 through 174 in Ninurta's return to Nibiru. Let my beloved city, the sanctuary Nibiru, raise its head. As high as heaven, let my city be preeminent among the cities of my brothers. Let my temple rise the highest among the temples of my brothers. Let the territory of my city be the fresh water well of summer. Let the Anuna, my brother gods, bow down there. Let their flying birds establish nests in my city. Let their refugees refresh themselves in my shade. The Sanctuary Nibiru. Okay, so as Ninurta went out from Enlil's temple, the most bright-faced of warriors, Ninkaranuna, having heard the favorable pronouncement of Ninurta, stepped before Lord Ninurta and prayed to him, My sovereign, <laughs> my sovereign, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. Lord Ninurta, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. May you be well disposed towards the sanctuary Nibiru, your beloved city. When you enter Isumisa, your beloved temple alone, tell your wife, young lady, Nin Ibiru. Yeah, literally, it's got two N's. It's spelled N-I-N-N I-B-R-U What is your heart? Tell her what is on your mind. Make an enduring, favorable pronouncement to her for the king. So, I want to read that to you at first before I read in full Ninurta's return to Nibiru. So that way it just kind of gives you an idea what is Nibiru. Now, here's the question. Where is it? It's still, I haven't gotten data points. I have put together, though, after reading this, the possibilities that Nimbru did cause the Great Flood, and you can give me your opinion in the comment section, and I'm sure you will. So, let's get started. Created like On, O son of Enlil, Ninurta, created like Enlil, born of Ninter, mightiest of the Anuna gods, who came forth from the mountain range, imbued with terrible awesomeness. Son of Enlil, confident in his strength, my sovereign, you are magnificent, let your magnificence therefore be praised. Ninurta, you are magnificent. Let your magnificence, therefore, be praised. Sovereign of all lands, in your massive might, warrior, O Enlil, warrior of Enlil, in your great might, fierce warrior, you have taken up the divine powers which are like heaven. Son of Enlil, you have taken up the divine powers which are like the earth. You have taken up the divine powers of the mountains, which are heavy as heaven. You have taken up the divine powers of Eridu, which are huge as the earth. You have made the gods prostrate themselves before you. You have made the Anuna salute you. Ninurta, you are made complete by heroic strength. The utterance of the sovereign is a storm. The word of Lord Ninurta is a storm to the hostile mountains, to the fortress of the rebellious land. Lord, frightfully fierce, fierce in heaven and earth. 
His angry utterance made a corpse of the mountains. His fierce countenance, horned wild bull, wild ram, and stag, the great wild bull of the mountains from its. He put his, the strength in battle, in his belt. The sovereign, with his heroic arms, Ninurta, the son of Enlil, in his great might, brought forth the six-headed wild ram from the shining lofty house. He brought forth the warrior dragon from the great fortress of the mountains. He brought forth the Magellan boat from his abzu. He brought forth the bison from his battle dust. He brought forth the mermaid from the limits of heaven and earth. He brought forth the gypsum from the soil of the mountain range. He brought forth the strong copper from the shattered mountain range. He brought forth the Anzud bird from the Holub Haran tree. He brought forth the seven-headed serpent from the mountains. He mustered them all before him. He spoke. He was unhappy. He spoke. He seized the axe. He took his. Let's take a pause there for a moment. And let's go back to what was just described. That sounds like some type of far out weaponry technology, very highly advanced. What did you gather from the heroic arms of Ninurta that brought forth the six headed wild ram from the shining lofty house? What's that? And what's the warrior dragon from the great fortress of the mountains? What's the Magellan boat from his Abzu? What about the bison from his battle dust? What about the mermaid from the limits of heaven and earth? What about the gypsum from soil of the mountain range? What are those? And then he brought forth strong copper from the shattered mountain range. So he mined copper. But what's the seven-headed serpent? And is the mermaid really a mermaid? Now, you all schooled me the other day when I said Enlil was roasting kids and kind of spooked me out a little bit. You're like, Rex, kids are baby goats. Well, it's still kind of spooky, but yeah, that's not nearly as spooky as children, obviously. Except for the goat. But a bah It's terrible. Terrible! Okay, so... Here we go. Let's go back. The warrior made a corpse of the mountains. Lord Ninurta, who destroys, made a corpse of the mountains. He piled up the sovereign with his heroic strength, wrecked his vengeance, wreaked his vengeance, the warrior Ninurta, with his heroic strength, wreaked his vengeance on his shining chariot, which inspires terrible awe. He hung his captured wild bulls on the axle and hung his captured cows on the cross piece of the yoke. He hung the six-headed wild ram on the dust guard. He hung the warrior dragon on the seat. He hung the Magellan boat on the... He hung the bison on the beam. He hung the mermaid on the footboard. Perfect place for the mermaid, right? He hung the gypsum on the forward part of the yoke. He hung the strong copper on the inside pole pin. He hung the Anzid bird on the front guard. He hung the seven-headed serpent on the shining cross beam. Now, Lord Ninurta stepped into his battle-worthy chariot, Ud-Ani, or Ud-Ana, the all-seeing god, and Lugal Anbara, the bearded lord, went before him and the awesome one of the mountains. Lugal Ker Dub, the of Lord Ninurta, followed behind him the lion who, from the Abzu, who, on's awesomeness and radiance, the Anuna, the great gods, as the sovereign swept, on like the deluge of Ninurta, storm of the rebellious land, swept on like the deluge, he rumbled like a storm on the horizon. So let's take a time out here for a minute. Swept on like the deluge as Ninurta, storm of the rebellious land. Swept on like the deluge. 
Is it Ninurta that caused the flood? Ninurta is the son of Enlil. So did Enlil ask Ninurta to cause the flood? Now, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. The scriptures that are in the Holy Bible, most of them, many of them in the Old Testament anyway, came from these Sumerian texts. And Enlil is Yahweh. Enlil drinks a lot of alcohol. He eats a lot of goats. And Enlil seems more human in the description of the Sumerian texts than in the Hebrew, Abrahamic, Holy Bible or Old Testament. You get a lot more detail when you get into Enlil's life with Sumerian translations that are far older than the Hebrew or the Greek or the English version. If you guys don't see the parallels, I'm thinking of some good reference points for you. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Read it. The Go back and look at the Sumerian translations that I have been reading and these ancient texts that correlate very strongly with what you read in the Bible with a lot more detail and depth and once again, guys, I am not taken away from God by any means. If anything, I think I'm giving God more credit by saying God is far superior than what most people can see or even understand, let alone if you take the small amounts of information that are detailed about God or what is supposed to be all-knowing, all everywhere, at every second, etc., you know, the, the creator of fates, the creator of everything. The description is so minuscule and inferior in words, let alone in a compilation of texts that have been rewritten, retranslated, added to, taken from, and sculpted over thousands of years. It's absolutely fascinating. And it makes you realize that there's a reason why things are the way that they are. For people that ask questions sometimes like that if you believe the you know, divine providence creator of all is Yahweh described in the Old Testament, which is totally cool. I'm, I'm, I respect your opinions and I respect your beliefs. That's, everybody has the right to their own beliefs. Yet if you go through these scriptures and you connect the dots and you come to the conclusion that Yahweh is Enlil and then you read about the Great Flood, and you read about all this pain, suffering, consequences that people go through, and all of the laws and rules and regulations that are compiled over the years where people are trying to create order out of chaos. It makes more sense when you read these Sumerian scribes and you realize, well, you know, Enlil, when he manipulated the creation that was already there with Enki, you know, Enki, Enlil, the Sumerian Council, these Anunnaki, when they manipulated the creation that was already organic, they didn't look at us the way that we would look at, the way that we look at ourselves. They would look at us the way that we would look at if you are a, you know, if you don't have much remorse for animals, and let's just say that, you know, you're, you're the kind of person that likes to, to do sport hunting, that you have a high-powered rifle and you enjoy shooting animals in a caged area and you think that's a sport. Well, the way that you look at that animal would be similar to the way that these guys look at us or did look at us. Or it would be similar to the way scientists do genetic experiments on animals and say that it's for the greater good of mankind. You know, for them, maybe it's for their greater good. So maybe after thousands of years of being suppressed and already wiping out the majority of the planet once already, maybe they're starting to think, okay, look at these guys. They are absolute, They absolutely have a right to be here just like we do. But what if they fear us? What if the Anunnaki, what if the engineers that are talked about, the, the Archons and the Gnostic texts, which I think that Yahweh is Yaldabaoth, and I think Yaldabaoth is Enlil. 
And it doesn't mean that what they say is correct, and it doesn't mean that what I think is correct. Yet, if there is a resonance there, and you want to believe many of these ancient texts that talk about how once man was created, especially the Gnostic version, that these fallen angels or these creators realized that Adam and Eve, their creation, was greater than they were. So what did they do? Well, what have they been doing? They've continued to suppress and keep down. And if you look at even many movies and films and art that has been played throughout the history of ages, that same archetype is very fluid as a warning and a reminder that just because you create, create something doesn't mean it's artificial intelligence. If you create an intelligence, well, that spark came from somewhere, came from divine source. You came from divine source. Everything comes from source. I mean, even the definition of source. Think about that. Source. So, it wasn't as if they created something that was greater than them at the aspect of source. It was as if they created a vessel for source to travel through that could be more functional than the engineer you know, kind of like in the okay this is a spoiler alert i'm just going to give a quick spoiler so if you haven't seen alien covenant yet i'm warning you i'm giving you three seconds two one alien covenant beginning of the film david is an android that's created and the creator says what do you see david and david says i see a white room i see a piano and david virtually almost immediately realizes he is greater than the Creator. <laughs> and the Creator says, Get me some tea, David. Get me the tea.com for the best in supplements. Use the code Leak Project." And then so David gets this confused look on his face, and he goes, What? And he goes, Get me some tea, David. So he brings him over tea, and he's like, Why am I bringing him tea? I am way better than him. And the moral of the story is the creator asked Dave to get him tea because the, crea the creator is told by David after he creates him, David says, you know, isn't it interesting that I'm going to live forever and you're going to die and you created me? And that's when he asked, hey, get me some tea. Get me the tea.com. Because by bringing him over the tea, he felt like that was a way for him to kind of put him in his place. But also the creator got this look on his face like, oh, my gosh, he's right. Man, and you could tell he was upset and he was frustrated when he said that. So, on top of that, you know, we're not quite done with the spoiler alert here. At the end of the film, or towards the end of the film, a big plot is uncovered about how David, the artificial intelligence, that is an artificial intelligence, but the android that's created with consciousness, wipes out the entire planet of engineers. All biology on the planet except for plant life. The plant life, the plant kingdom still there, but all animals are destroyed. And what you have left is this weird bio nano technology that infuses with biological DNA and creates this H.R. Giger style alien of hybrid proportions. It's just, it's fascinating. And I think to myself, how much of this stuff has already taken place? How much of this stuff is unfolding now somewhere? even here in certain levels, and they are giving us a teaser, a taste of what's really going on somewhere, sometime. And then you get into the whole timeline thing, and that's all in perspective as well. Is time really linear? Show me the line. Now let's go back here. When at Enlil's command, he... Okay, no, here we go. 76 through 79. When, at Enlil's command, he was making his way towards Ikur, the warrior of the gods was leveling the land, and before he had approached Nibru from afar, Nuska, the chancellor of Enlil, came forth from the Ikur to meet him. He greeted Lord Ninurta, my sovereign, perfect warrior. Heed yourself, Ninurta, perfect warrior. Heed yourself. Your radiance was covered Enlil's let me repeat that. Your radiance has covered Enlil's temple like a cloak. When you step into your chariot, whose creaking is a pleasant sound, heaven and earth tremble when you raise your arm. I think that sounds like weapons of mass destruction. 
Just brought that up in a podcast yesterday. 7,000-year-old text talking about weapons of mass destruction that suck down an entire mile of a river in one drink and are never done with the quench of their thirst and eat trees in their mouths and crush them up in their mouths. Sounds like some type of industry tech. Let's go back. 8791. The Ananu, or Anuna, the great gods, do not frighten your father in his residence. Do not frighten Enlil in his residence. May your father give you gifts because of your heroic strength. May Enlil give you gifts because of your heroic strength. O sovereign, shackle of On, first among the gods, sill bearer of Enlil, life source of Akur. O warrior, because you have toppled the mountains, your father need send out no other god besides you. Ninurta, because you have toppled the mountains, Enlil need send out no other god beside you. While these words were yet in Nuska's mouth, Ninurta put the whip and goat away in the rope box. He leaned his mace, the strength in battle against the box, and entered into the temple of Enlil. He directed his captive wild bulls into the temple. He directed the captive cows, like the wild bulls, into the temple. He laid out the booty, bingo, of the plundered cities. The Anuna were amazed. Enlil, the great mountain, made obeisance to him. And Asimbabar prayed to him, the great mother Ninlil, from when her Kiur spoke admiringly to Lord Ninurta, a wild bull, the fierce horns raised, son of Enlil, you have struck blows in the mountains. Warrior Lord Ninurta, you have, you have the rebellious land. Lord Ninurta answered her, my mother, I alone cannot with you. Ninlil, I alone cannot with you for me alone. Battle arrayed like heaven, no one can rival me. Like the deluge, smashing the mountains like reed huts. There he goes again talking about the deluge. My battle, like an onrushing flood, overflowed in the mountains with a lion's body and lion's muscles. It rose up in the rebellious land. The gods have become worried and flee to the mountain ranges. They beat their wings like a flock of small birds. They stand hiding in the grass like wild bulls. No one can confront my radiance heavy as heaven. Because I am the lord of the terraced mountain ranges in every direction, because I have subjugated these mountain ranges of alabaster and lapis lazuli, the Anuna hide like mice. Now I have reestablished my heroic strength in the mountains. On my right I bear my mows down a myriad, a myriad on my left. I bear my crushies a myriad. I bear my fifty-tooth storm, my heavenly mace. I bear the hero who comes down from the great mountains. My no resting, no resisting this storm. I bear the weapon which devours corpses like a dragon. My agasilagax, I bear my. Now let's take a time out here. What kind of weapon devours corpses like a dragon? I want one of those things. I bear my, I bear the alkadnet of the rebellious land. My alkadnet, I bear that from which the mountains cannot escape. My suskel net, I bear the seven mouth musma serpent, the slayer, my spike. I bear that which strips away the mountains. The sword, my heavenly dagger. So it sounds to me like a space weapon. My heavenly dagger. Sounds like a space sword or something. Maybe it has laser beams that come out of the edges and like nanotechnology that emits with a big beam when you just go, oh, or maybe they go, oh, you get, remember that Street Fighter 2? Oh, you get, don't go to get, don't go to go to <laughs> All right, let's go back. I bear the deluge of battle, my 50-headed mace. I bear the storm that attacks humans, my bow and quiver. Humans, not Anunnaki, but humans. Hmm. So did he mean when he said humans just like people, or did he mean like 
I'm a freaking alien and humans are inferior to me because we manipulated you. I bear the deluge of battle, my 50-headed mace. And I'm connecting the 50 with Marduk. I bear the storm that attacks humans, my bow and quiver. I bear those which carry off the temples of the rebellious land, my throw stick and shield. I bear the helper of men, my spear. I bear that which brings forth light like the day, my obliterator of the mountains. Obliterator of the mountains. I bear the maintainer of the people in heaven and earth. My, the enemy, cannot escape. So what is the obliterator of the mountains? That thing sounds pissed. He's got some dragon weapon. He's got a, a seven-headed serpent weapon. He's got a unicorn weapon. Oh, wait, he doesn't have a unicorn weapon, but he does have the mermaid weapon. He's got a freaking mermaid on his foot stool. I mean, this dude's pissed. He's got all sorts of crazy things to throw at people. And talk about what Daryl Sims says. You know, ex-CIA guy that's been abducted multiple times, pulling microchips out of people. Talking about how he thinks all these aliens are actually clones and cloned on a spaceship that's actually not too far from Earth. Well, could that be the Anunnaki? He talks about these beings behind that are kind of... He, doesn't, he didn't talk much about him. But what I was able to pick up is he thinks that fallen angels are controlling the scenes. Well, fallen angels, Anunnaki, call them whatever you want. Shape-shifting, reptilian, draconian, supercalifragilistic, expialidocious creatures. I mean, they're intense. Mary Poppins could kick their ass, though. I'm just saying. Mary Poppins is awesome. Okay, so here we go. I bear that whose awesome radiance covers the land, which is grandly suited for my right hand, finished in gold and lapis lazuli, whose presence is amazing. My object of trust, I bear the perfect weapon, exceedingly magnificent, trustworthy in battle, having no equal, well suited for my wrist on the battlefield. My 50-headed mace, I bear the weapon which consumes the rebellious land like fire. My 50 headed club. Now let's go back to this weapon that has no equal that's wrapped around his wrist. You see images of that in the Sumerian in Sumerian art. It's incredible. I mean that's way above and beyond a Rolex. Boom! Hello! Ding dong! I am the strong one unopposed in the mountains. I am Ninurta. Let them prostrate themselves at my name I am the exceedingly mighty lion-headed one of Enlil, whom he engendered in his strength. The storm of heaven, the shackle of the gods, I am the one whom on in his great might has chosen. There, he, there it is again. He's talking about the shackle of the gods, the storm of heaven. That's weapons of mass destruction. I am the, the life source of Inanna. I am the warrior destined with Enki to be suited for the fearsome divine powers. Let my kingship be manifest under the ends of heaven and earth. I am most able among the gods. Let me be imbued with great awesomeness. Awesome. Let my beloved city, the sanctuary Nibiru, raise its head as high as heaven. Hmm, so what does he mean by that? Let my sanctuary Nibiru raise its head as high as heaven has something to do with the stars. So is Nibiru a city, not an actual planet? Is Nibiru a city? And let's say it's a city. And then he says he wants to take the city as high as heaven, headed as high as heaven. Does he turn this city into like a spaceship, a giant spaceship? And the orbit is 3,600 years, and he creates this spaceship that's so enormous that that's what causes certain catastrophes. Let my city be preeminent among the cities of my brothers. Let my temple rise the highest among the temples of my brothers. Let the territory of my city be the freshwater well of summer. Let the Anuna, my brother gods, bow down there. Let their flying birds establish nests in my city. Let their refugees refresh themselves in my shade. As Ninurta went out from Enlil's temple, the most bright-faced of warriors. 
Ninkarnuna, having heard the favorable pronouncement of Ninurta, stepped before Lord Ninurta and prayed to him, My sovereign, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. Lord Ninurta, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. May you be well disposed towards the sanctuary, Nibiru, your beloved city. When you enter Isumisa, your beloved temple alone, tell your wife, your lady, Ninibru, what is in your heart, tell her what is in your mind, make an enduring favorable pronouncement to her for the king. The content of the prayer of the offspring of a prince, Ninkam Nuna, his sprinkling, Ninurta's heart, with an offering of cool water, and the matter of prosperity about which he spoke were pleasing to Ninurta's heart as he went in procession to Isu Misa to manifest the eternal divine powers. Lord Ninurta gazed approvingly at Nikarnuna. When Ninurta entered Isu Misa, his beloved temple alone, he told his wife, young lady Ninibiru, what was in his heart. He told her what was on his mind, and he made an enduring favorable pronouncement to her for the king. The warrior whose heroism is manifest, Ninurta, the son of Enlil, has firmly grounded his greatness in Enlil's sanctuary, Lord who has destroyed the mountains, who has no rival, who butts angrily in that magnificent battle. Great warrior who goes forth in his might strong one, deluge of Enlil, deluge of Enlil, Ninurta, magnificent child of Ikur, pride of the father, who engendered him. It is sweet to praise you, Sir Gita of Ninurta. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, credit where credit is due. These guys did a great job. And here's another thing, too. Do you want to learn Sumerian? Do you want to translate these scribes yourself? Because there's a whole bunch of scribes on here that haven't been translated into English. You can actually do it yourself if you've got the time because these guys even have the different symbols and what letters they represent, what words they represent. It's awesome. Now, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. I, up, I update sometimes five or more podcasts a day, usually at least four podcasts a day. I'm going to get to the point to where we're doing 10 podcasts a day. If you become a premium member, you're going to get access to exclusive content. Also, I've got live shows on the horizon. So if you go to leakproject.com, if you want to become an exclusive member, 10 bucks a month, 50 bucks a year, you'll get access to the premium content section. Great gems of knowledge in the premium section. And check out these quick bivvies, ladies and gentlemen. They could literally help save your life. They fit in the palm of your hand. If you get in a situation where you're cold and you need to stay warm, if you have this quick bivvy, it's going to help you out a lot. Put one in your bug out bag. Put one in your camper bag. Put one under your car seat. Put one in your fanny pack if you go on a hike. Seriously. They're awesome. Check them out. Quick Bivy. I'm going to leave a link in the video description box. And also support our sponsors, GetTheTea.com. If you're looking for the best in health supplements, GetTheTea.com has a plethora of products that are very high caliber. I've been taking this stuff called Colostrum. I love it. I've also been taking their D365 tabs. They're great for detox. Uh, I just got this new stuff called Slippery Elm Bark or something like that. And I'll have to double check that. It's something bark. And it's supposed to be really good for uh, cardiovascular health too. So, hey, why not? I'll try that out. I, it's not like I need to worry about that. But any type of preventative maintenance is good for you if you take it in the right amount. So, you know, as long as you're not allergic to it or something like that, there's always good, there's always good types of preventative maintenance, I should say, that you can take advantage of to offset things that can happen on the horizon. I mean, if you look at many people out there that get really sick and become super overweight, you know, a lot of, th you don't become 50 pounds overweight overnight. It takes a period of time to do that. And if you can stay healthy, if there's good supplements that you can take to offset certain things from just everyday elements, you know, and being in an environment that is constantly being polluted with different poisons at a certain level, preventative maintenance can be very beneficial. So check out GetTheTea.com, and after you make your purchase, let them know you heard about them through Leak Project. That definitely helps us out a lot as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. I can't wait to get your interpretation on Ninurta's return to Nibru. 
What is Nibiru? Where is Nibiru? Is it coming back? Is it a city on Earth? What is it? Question everything. Be the change you want to see. Aranuna, having heard the favorable pronouncement of Ninurta, stepped before Lord Ninurta and prayed to him, My sovereign, <laughs> my sovereign, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. Lord Ninurta, may you be well disposed towards your beloved city. May you be well disposed towards the sanctuary Nibiru, your beloved city. When you enter Isumisa, your beloved temple alone, tell your wife, young lady, Nin Ibaru. Yeah, literally, it's got two N's. It's spelled N I N N. Sanctuary Nibiru, raise its head as high as heaven. Let my city be preeminent among the cities of my brothers. Let my temple rise the highest among the temples of my brothers. Let the territory of my city be the fresh water well of summer. Let the Anuna, my brother gods, bow down there. Let their flying birds establish nests in my city. Let their refugees refresh themselves in my shade. The Sanctuary Nibiru. Okay, so as Ninurta went out from Enlil's temple, the most bright-faced of warriors, Ninkar, does this have a lot of discussion and details on Nibiru itself, but it also has weapons of mass destruction and galactic soap opera. I've noticed that with these Sumerian texts, the gods of the Anunnaki are quite theatrical, to say the least. And before I start, because I'm going to read this in full, there's a couple of passages that I want to read at the beginning and this is 168 through 174 in Ninurta's return to Nibiru. Let my beloved city, this Ninurta's return to Nibiru. What you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is a Sumerian text that could be well over 6,000 years old. It actually could be a text that was copied from another text that could be in the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of years old. It's called Ninurta's Return to Nibiru. And this is translated by various scholars at Oxford. I'd like to give them credit right now. You can see the project members right here on the screen. I'll leave a link in the video description box. So multiple scholars. And not only I, B, R, U. What is your heart? Tell her what is on your mind. Make an enduring, favorable pronouncement to her for the king. So, I want to read that to you at first before I read in full Ninurta's return to Nibiru. So that way it just kind of gives you an idea. What is Nibiru? Now, here's the question. Where is it? It's still, I haven't gotten data points. I have put together, though, after reading this, the possibilities that Nibiru did cause the Great Flood. And you can give me your opinion in the comment section, and I'm sure you will. So let's 